Anyway, I built this model and I got a DCF of about double the current stock price and I'm gonna go through kind of that um, scenario and why I think that um, the shares are, are sort of borderline between uh, being along and in terms of us adding it to our portfolio and also sort of borderline not um, not enough of a return. I don't think the stock could be a short. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but you know, I'm still new to the company and it would take more time for me to feel comfortable enough to establish a position. So anyway, I, I put down all the revenue uh, uh, the, all the income statement, you can see that they've had this really nice growth. But one of the things that you had that sort of jumped out at me is that they've had a lot of acquisitions. So it's not totally clear what organic growth is. And so if you look at this quarter, Q214, they grew 1% revenue growth. I mean, that is a very, very low amount of revenue growth. Now, having said that, um, I mean, just on pricing alone, they should be doing better than that. Um, so I'm not sure how much acquisitions are contributing to their revenue growth. And it makes it makes one wonder um, if uh, if um, there's uh, you know if the acquisitions are really driving the revenue growth. But we'll talk about that in a minute. But in any event, on average, they they've been doing pretty healthy growth, about thirteen percent revenue growth. And um, they just closed a major acquisition called NWP, which will add about ten percent to their revenue base. Um, if you look at the company, it looks like a very traditional software company. Um, they got uh, um, pretty normal financial metrics. Um, one of the things that stood out to me is that you know they, they like to quote EBITDA, but uh, I think that uh, I think that um, if you look at the company's cash flow statement, they have a lot of stock based compensation. Uh, expense and if you if you look at look at how much they've got ten million dollars on average in the last four quarters it sort of um, really obscures net income you know their net income is is pretty low and stock based compensation is obviously a um, cost you know it costs money to issue stock to your employees even if they're options and even if they're the investing schedules and all these things they still cost money um, it's a real cost and I don't like to exclude it. Um, so um, my sort of definition of free cash flow is free cash flow with uh, stock-based comps subtracted. So it's free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus CapEx, and then I subtract um, stock-based comp, and I get on average about $6 million of cash flow um, per quarter. And if you, you take six million times four for the whole year, you have twenty four million cash. Excuse me, cash flow. And so the company's trading at sixty seven times earnings, which um, you might say to yourself sounds like a lot, a big multiple. How could it be a good investment? Um, and that's sort of where the scale stuff comes in. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The growth isn't anywhere near, you know, companies like a Facebook or whatever. Um, it's only about 15 percent growth. So why would I pay 60 times earnings for 10% um, growth? And the reality is that the earnings number isn't really uh, reliable. The, even though I did a lot of calculations to get to the six million, even this number isn't really fair. Um, and this happens a lot when you see companies that, um, you know, I'll give you an example. Like when you do a PE or whatever ratio on a company that let's say, let's say we'll do trashy, trashy uh, software inc. And um, Trashy Software is a startup company. And my cat is the CEO. And here's sort of an easy model. You know, Trashy has You know, it, this could be a really valuable business, uh, but if you try to use a DCF or a, I'm sorry, PE ratio, you're, you're gonna have negative numbers and you really have to take a scale year. So the best PE ratio you could do is on a scale year like, say, 2022, when the company's established itself, it's, it's growing at a, a more reasonable pace. 
it's not um, it's not uh, it's sort of in a permanent state of, of reasonable margins and reasonable long-term cash flow. And if you do that, you can see that this is a much more reasonable. You could put a reasonable PE ratio like 15 times and then discount it back to the you know six periods, as opposed to trying to put a PE ratio in one of these years. You're going to have a really hard time doing that, and so you have to sort of think about scale a little bit when you do that. And of course, Trashy outsources. Uh, yeah, Trashy's the name of my my new cat. So anyway, I looked uh, looked at their uh, revenue growth. Uh, and other metrics for, for many years, including their, they like to throw out customers and properties. So they manage, um, or their software manages uh, 11 million properties, which if you think about it, is a really big number. If the average um, if the average household is sort of two or three people, the idea that um, this company's software manages um, probably 30 million living, uh, people living in the United States so it's a good 10% of all people. And then obviously, if you think about just rental markets in general, um, a lot of people live in a, in a home that they own. So if you kind of break that out, you'll see that um, they have quite a lot of market share. So in any event, um, you, know, the, um, you know, the revenue they get per unit that they're, that they're um, managing is about 40 bucks per unit, which struck me as a very low amount for an annual annual revenue for, you know, just one unit. Uh, it seems like the software is, is pretty valuable relative to that. The value proposition is pretty good. So I thought that was a nice sort of smell test. Um, if I was managing an apartment, a set of apartment buildings, and I had to pay RealPage 40 bucks per unit per year, that sounds like a great deal. Um, so in any event, um, and the math adds up, right? There's 10 million properties, 40 bucks a property is 400 million in revenue. So they gave guidance of 575, and if you exclude the the um, the so it's kind of interesting, right? So they gave guidance that they'll do 570 million dollars of revenue this year, and that's 23 percent growth. But they they acquired NWP, and so NWP is going to give them 45 million of revenue. So if you exclude NWP, you could see that they were originally without NWP planning on growing 13 percent which kind of tells you what they'll grow for the foreseeable future, in a sense. At least that should be the most that they'll grow in the foreseeable future without doing more acquisitions. So that was a good way to sort of derive, um, kind of derive or think about what their opportunity is, and there's other ways to think about it. They also have said that they ho hope to have a billion in revenue by 2020, which I thought was really interesting because I don't, I don't think they can get there without acquisitions. Either way, what you'll see is that I predict that this company will be acquired most likely by Oracle. Oracle is a, is a software company that tends to acquire other software companies. Most software companies, in fact, tend to be acquired. Um, it's a very acquisitive industry. And this is a neat vertical. Vertical is a, a word that means sort of a subsector or fragment. And this is the real estate software fragment. And um, in essence, uh, um, what I think will happen is their GNA, you can see that they're spending 70 or $80 million running their software company. And I think that that amount of money can drop basically to almost nothing, 10, just $10 million uh, if they're acquired. And they almost certainly would be acquired. Then I also think that they'll save money and have some synergies on product development. So you can see I have the product development going down by just about 20%. I have no savings in the sales and marketing force. Even though they'll probably would save money in sales and marketing, I expect that just to be conservative, they in, in an acquisition they wouldn't get any um, any synergies on sales and marketing. So I gave them the traditional revenue growth. I have them doing thirty percent in taxes, and obviously, if they're acquired by the right kind of software company, they can re-domicile and maybe be able to save further on taxes, maybe down to twenty-five or twenty percent. So there's some upside there. In fact, I used to do something right here called just called tax rate, and maybe I'll start bringing that back in my model. So it's pretty simple. If you just plug in like this, you can adjust the tax rate yourself. So there's some European companies like Ireland that you know, if an Irish company bought them, they could be down to a 10% tax rate, um, which is pretty important. 
Um, so so we'll, we'll adjust that in a second. ROIC is really important, right? So this is the this is the idea that I've sort of created that management will use cash that builds up in their company, and you can see here that the cash building up in their company. Um, I should probably X out the NWP cash, but I think they have $80 million that they acquired NWP for. But the point is, um, the point is that um, management will take cash that is building up their company and they'll use it. And, and this company, RealPage, has certainly done that. They've done like 20, 30 acquisitions uh, in the last 10 years. And so they're a very acquisitive um, company. And this, this, because the CEO owns 30% of the company, he's going to be like a bloodhound for, for creating value. Um, the same way um, I am in my companies, because if you own 30%, think about it, he owns 32% of a $1.6 billion company. This guy is worth $500 million. So you, you better believe that he is working his ass off, as opposed to your average CEO that doesn't even own 1% of his company. He's getting a big fat salary. Um, you can't have enough of a salary to make it interesting if you're worth $500 million. You know, um, it doesn't matter what your salary is. What you're worried about is getting the stock price up. Hopefully it can be 30 or 40 or 50. In fact, I think it could go to 50. And if it goes to 50, this guy would be worth $1.2, $1.3 billion. That's really amazing. Um, so anyway, the point is that, you know, that this guy is, is very rich. And, and uh, just by looking at kind of the way that he's operated, I think he's going to deliver a lot of returns for his shareholders. So the discount rate's low because their retention rate is enormous. They, they manage 25%. I think of rental opportunities in the United States, um, and their customers renew at a 95 plus percentage. And then um, I think that uh, um, the maturity is probably going to be a positive rate, a marginally positive rate. You can make it a marginally negative rate if you want, but I picked uh, 2021, uh, 2021 as uh, the maturity year, which is um, pretty close. That's just five years away. So a small positive rate is pretty reasonable, I think. And depending on the tax rate, if they stay um, uh, in the US or their acquirer doesn't uh, rationalize the tax structure, um, you know, you can sort of play with that. Um, the ROIC doesn't shift things a ton. It adds like five bucks a share, but I think that makes sense. The discount rate is low. And so I get $41 a share um, for the stock and right now it's at 22, so that's basically a double. That's usually good enough for me. Um, so that's sort of the way I look at it. And again, you would not be able to make this work if you assume that they just had their GNA spending, uh, you know, the same forever, because it doesn't make sense that this company would exist just to be a software company just for the real estate market. Uh, they should be bought by a big software company like SAP or Oracle. And my guess is that'll, that'll be what happens. So it doesn't really matter why I made maturity so early. Um, you know, I could I could have tried to forecast cash flow more accurately for the next sort of ten periods, but it wouldn't have made a difference. Um, in fact, I'm being conservative by sort of ending their growth period. This is a smart management team that will probably keep growing. Um, so my guess is this is sort of what will happen. They're subscale with their margins for a reason, and I think it's you know they they they're focused on growth. Um, and a bigger company or private equity could chop at least $100 million out of their um, cost structure. So I think of the company as a $200 million net income company over the long term. They've actually said that when they hit a billion in revenue, they expect $300 million in EBITDA. So it's roughly what the company is telling you they, they think they'll do. Um, you know, from my perspective, this is, a, this is an attractive market. Um, and it sounds like their, their software provides a lot of value add given their customers just pay 40 bucks per unit to manage really valuable properties. So that's basically where, where I'm at. Um, yeah, so the tax rate thing is that I assume they'll be acquired by a company that manages their taxes better. This is a company based in Texas. Um, they don't really pay taxes as far as I can tell right now, so I don't really think it matters. but. Um, over the long run, if SAP acquires them or some other company acquires them, they'll put them in some weird domicile and then all of a sudden they, um, they'll they uh, be fine. So they don't really have any competitors is the way I look at it. They have such a big installed base that you know they, they own the market. 
is the way I look at it. And um, R and D will grow, but and I have it growing at a pretty healthy rate. But um, R and D isn't really; it's just product maintenance in essence. So anyway, that's sort of the way I looked at this model. I think most CEOs that own 30% of their company, this is the only way for them to monetize. Like they want to get rich, so they'd love to sell the company. Um, you know, that's sort of like a key thing for these guys. So anyway, let's let's look at some of the, some of the models that people made. So that was pretty fast. So in half an hour, I I got through all of that. So this is from Louis Louis de Maria, Louis de Maria. Uh, he makes a thing called. Recap, which is nothing, uh, not my preferred style. In fact, I found this revenue breakdown hidden away in an appendix that shows that they 30% um, property management, 30% resident services, 25% um, leasing and marketing, and 10% asset optimization. I think they could hugely increase their ARPU, um, hugely increase their ARPU. And this is not uncommon, by the way, in software as a service, when you have a subscription model. You have a, a low uh, ARPU because what you really want is subscribers. And then eventually you can turn on the services and make them uh, premium. And uh, Netflix is a good example. Um, I want to short Netflix, and I'll talk to you guys about why. Uh, and maybe we'll take an investment committee vote. It's Steve Wynn. It's not the Steve Wynn. It's a different Steve Wynn. Um, Um, so anyway, the, um, I think they can really um, grow their ARPU quite a bit um, and get to that, um, get to their billion dollar forecast pretty easily, in which case the stock could be even worth more than 40 bucks a share. So anyway, yeah, I mean, these guys don't have inflated subscribers. They just got their property management. Um, it might be inflated. Who knows? Who knows? Anyway, let's go to Louis DeMaria's model. So he doesn't doesn't use my format, even though it's pretty important. And for instance, if I didn't know that their software does so many different things for their client, I'd be a little less excited about the company. But they're actually pretty diverse um, within their service offering, and that's because they've done so many acquisitions. I think they they really have broadened out um, uh, what they're trying to do. You can just put shares in millions. I don't see why you would put it in thousands. So. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And this should be uh, right adjusted. And then there should be no spaces between these. I mean, if you look at all of my models are available online and I don't understand why you can't just copy my, my format. It's not that hard. Um, and then uh, cash is, you said it was 30 million. I said it was 100, um, 116. Uh, I think you probably excluded the restricted cash, which is fine. I'm not going to debate that. Um, all right, RealPage has grown in the past year through acquisitions and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. So they're growing without acquisitions. Um, they're growing without acquisitions, but they definitely are enhancing their growth with acquisition. Uh, introducing a highly fragmented market is a uh, user based company monetized users at $43 a year. It's not really users, it's more properties, but I get your point. It generates a lot of cash. I don't, I mean, they don't really. That's the interesting thing. If they, if you look at the free cash flow minus just free cash flow, I guess, it's, it's, it's positive, and you're right that cash flow is higher than net income. Like, if you look at, um, Cash flow here, it's it's way higher than their reported net income, right? Here on average, it's twenty four million dollars a quarter. Um, but if you look at the uh, capex, it's eight million a quarter. So, um, you know, it's 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 definitely positive, more positive, right? Sixty three million in free cash flow. But stock based comp, I mean, is it's not cash, but it's dilution, so it it counts. Um, and so if you just if you ignore stock based comp for whatever reason, which I think is a little crazy, it's twenty times earnings, uh, twenty six times earnings, but you're ignoring a key cost. So I don't know um, that I totally agree with the cash, the cash, uh, cash generation concept. 
I don't think the rental vacation market concept is uh, that's where their growth is. Most of their properties are, are not that. Most of their properties are just apartments. I don't think Airbnb is a threat because Airbnb is really a consumer consumer product. Tried to make, okay, here it is. I don't really understand what you're doing here, but I'm gonna give it a shot. I don't know where you got this information from. It'd be nice if you quoted quoted where you got it from, because otherwise you, uh, um, it's too hard to know where you got that information from. And I wouldn't focus on competition that much. So it'd be good to know where you got this ARPU number, but obviously, you know, there's there's a potential, definitely a potential for increased ARPU. Yeah, I don't, I, I, didn't, I don't agree with how you built your model on revenue per TAM. I think that's kind of crazy, maybe even silly. Does it really make sense? For, they, they're telling you it's an $11 billion market, but that doesn't mean anything. Um, really doesn't mean anything. I don't know why you're bolding gross profit, but God bless you. Um, you just put in 10% revenue growth forever. It doesn't really make sense. Um, the scale thing, you ignore it as well. Um, so your EBIT, like it doesn't, this doesn't make any sense really, this model, because you, you, you have them I mean, think about it. You have them going from a $500 million company to a $2 billion company, and their margins don't go up. That doesn't make any sense. The whole point of growing your revenue is to have high, even higher margins as well. So that's a really, um, margin expansion is just sort of basic, basic idea. Do you even margin expansion, expand, grow? All right, so I give you a D. Um, this margin expansion is pretty obvious. You're going to have a lot higher margins when you're uh, two billion dollars in revenue than than uh, a five hundred million dollar in revenue company. That's that uh, is pretty obvious. Um, uh, let's see. Net present value. You don't have a maturity. You don't have a perpetuity terminal value, which. Uh, I don't know why you think the company ends in 2030. Like, do you think, is, there a, is that the Mayan end of time? What happens in 2030? Aliens? Aliens are coming? Drones? Doesn't make any sense. You th Talk to the CEO and say, what do you think is going to happen in 2030? Do you th still think people are going to be using your software? Obviously. Obviously. And then your tax rates are all messed up. You have negative taxes. I want to know what country that is. <laughs> Negative taxes? Cool. All right. So this was, uh, maybe that, maybe it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm done with this model. Circular references, kill it too. 
put a bum. That was a bum ass model. Put some respect on it next time. All right, Pavel. Nice, he's got the CEO. <laughs> I love Pavel's models. I'll try to uh, I'll try to upload the videos earlier. I'll, I'll do my best. I like how he puts the CEO's picture there. That's uh, you know, do you trust this guy? What do you guys think? Yes or no? Do you try? That is the grade. It's a it's a bum ass model. Bum ass model. Or just bum ass. I think it's fine. Do you uh? Oh, you you did do a terminal value. I don't know. Your gar garbage model is not even worth looking. You trust this guy? He, he looks very Texan, I will say that. Very Texan. There are some comments on Glassdoor that, that, you know, management doesn't know much about tech. That's not uncommon. Larry Elson doesn't know shit about software. Enterprise software is basically... It's funny, CEOs of enterprise software companies are, um, are like very salesy, very like salesy. Think about uh, um, Larry Ellison as the king, um, Steve Ballmer, like these guys are born salesmen and they're like terrible technologists. It's pretty funny stuff. And um, he seems like a very basic enterprise value um, company. Uh, CEO, enterprise software company CEO. Um, he owns 30% of the company, which means he's extremely rich. He's half a billionaire and um, he's going to take care of the company, I think. Anyway, this is nice. Uh, 32 acquisitions, exactly. 46 million rental, rental units. I thought it was interesting that they had 440 reps. I like that you got the 32% thing down there. And this is good, I like this. I like that you put the stock incentive plan in here. Uh, I don't think they've got 26 million shares in the plan. You spelled incentive wrong, but definitely maybe maybe uh, well they had, that could be how many they have authorized, but I think they only have about five million options. Maybe more. I don't know. Twenty six sounds like a lot. You got the goal. That's good. It's all very good. Good modeling. Good good note taking for sure, Pavel. Two thousand fifteen revenue was fifty eight million, and so they expect it just closed. So let's actually do the math here. So it closed. So fifty eight divided by twelve is five million a month. And if they were going to grow fifty eight from fifty eight million, let's say they were going to grow five percent. So uh, they would have had sixty one million per uh, for twenty sixteen. They closed the acquisition on. March 7th, so they're gonna get 10 months. So they said that they expect 45, I wanna say, from NWP, but they closed the acquisition a little early, right? So they're gonna probably get closer to 50, which isn't enough to really quibble about, but that's pretty good, Pavel. Cloud solution is a problem for some companies? Yeah, I don't know, I think that's, that's probably not the case. Yardy? I like that you looked into Yardy. I don't know anything about Yardy. Very nice, very nice. It's one of the better front pages I've seen. Beautiful. And look at the model, it's exactly, it's exactly how I like it. I'll be right back. Um, I'm gonna get a soda. Another soda. 
Chashi. My cat is very shy, so. All right. Let's see here. Now the important stuff. It's weird, you bold gross profit, but you don't bold revenue. Well, revenue is more important, come on. Don't, don't bold too many things. The only thing I like to bold is revenue. I like this. Goal is one billion in revenue? I don't think so. Wow, Pobble. You got some, you got some respect. Put some respect on it. Only if they buy more companies. That's what I think. I think it's, this is interesting. How do you get this? How do you get them three, then 15, then five, then one, then six? That's pretty weird. You have the maturity negative two. That's, I'm not gonna quibble over that. 6%, I'm not gonna quibble over that. This is weird though. They have 80 million shares outstanding. Not 17. So, pretty, pretty bizarre. Hmm. This is uh, Pavel. That's kind of bizarre. Yeah, I don't like this kind of forecasting, just 18% of revenue, because it doesn't imply that they'll gain any scale. Like, if you look at the margin, operating margin, you have them gaining a little bit of scale, but not much. Very, what's this? That's, what is, this is not. Operating margin is, is operating income divided by revenue. Poor Pavel. And you only have them going to 6% operating margin at a billion dollar company. That doesn't make any sense. So you did a lot of things wrong here. Uh, C minus. All right. Yeah, some of this stuff is just silly. Like, you. You're telling me the stock is worth $4 a share, basically. Because you put in the wrong number, which is really embarrassing. The stock's worth $4 a share. It's trading at 21. Why isn't it the greatest short ever? Why aren't you begging me to short the stock? Dumbass. I will say, if you guys come up with a really good stock pick, and you say, hey, Martin, I got a really good stock pick. Um, here it is, and it works. And it makes some money. And the next time... You come up with a really good stock pick, and I say, all right, I'm gonna put $5 million into it. And you say, that's good, because you're gonna double your money. It's gonna go to 10 million, you're gonna make 5 million. And as part of the deal, because I want stocks like this, and you gave me your first stock pick for free, and it was really good, this time I'm gonna pay you 10%. That's 500 Gs. But this isn't a joke, this isn't a game. You're talking about, you're talking about being a franchise player. 